Change our heart, O oh God, that they might be more like your heart. Your heart that loves unconditionally. Your heart that heals. Your heart that strengthens and rebuilds. Your heart that empowers. Change our hearts, O oh God. That we might know we've been in your presence today. We've heard your voice. We've felt your love. And that everything we might do or say brings honor and glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't know if this is happening in your household or not, but this is the season of physical checkups. Everybody's getting ready to go back to school, and so we've got to go to the doctor, do that physical checkup thing, get the form signed so everybody can do the athletics in school, right? So it's happening. This is a season for a lot of children that it's physical che checkup. And the truth is, as you get older, we still have to do those checkups, right? But when we know that checkup is coming up, we, we like go, okay, I'm going to start watching what I eat a little bit more. You know, I want that, that pounds on the scale to be just as, as low as I can possibly get when I go there so that the doctor doesn't give me that regular lecture about eating more fruits and vegetables and all that stuff. And I'm going to work on really maybe exercising a little bit more so my blood pressure is a little bit down. And they say, good girl, you're making that blood pressure go down. And I, I might even add a little more walking into what I'm doing so that my heart looks good when I do that checkup, right? I'm not the only weird one doing that, right? That we try to get our bodies healthier. We're a little bit more focused about being healthier when we know we're going to be checked up on than maybe two months after the doctor's appointment, right? Oh, that ice cream looks really good now. It's 10 months away. And so really what the text today is in inviting us to, in both the gospel and in the James passage, is to do a heart checkup. Now Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, right? And they're giving him garbage because his disciples are not doing this ritual cleaning. So I guess Jesus would be a proponent for the five-second rule. Okay? He's saying, what you're taking in is not going to mess you up. It's not going to make you dirty. It doesn't matter who you eat with. It doesn't matter what you do here. It's consume, consume, right? What comes out of you, what comes out of your heart, is what defiles you. And that's a pretty strong statement. And so today we're just going to do a little bit of a spiritual heart checkup. I'm not putting you on the stress machine with the treadmill or any of that stuff. We're just going to do a little heart checkup. And David Luce, who's a regular blogger about um, the lectionary text, says what he likes about James is that he makes it really simple. We tend to think of being faithfulness to being a faithful person of Christ is that we have to do heroic deeds. Like we have to feed 5,000 people and, 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 and you know, save tremendous lives. And what he's saying is, no, it's not being heroic to be faithful. It's being faithful in the little things. The little things like not judging someone when you meet them. The little things like not saying mean and ugly things about your neighbor and realizing that they carry the image of God with them. them. The little things like meeting somebody who is sick. Those seem like little things, right? Not heroic. And that's what David says, is that it's not being heroic to be faithful. It's in the little things. The other thing he says is the Sunday is the least important day of the week. What we do here on Sundays really doesn't matter if we're not doing the faithful stuff during the week. If we're not greeting someone that we have not encountered before. If we're not welcoming the stranger. If we're not doing something when somebody is hungry and sick. So those are the kind of the things. So if you fall asleep right now, you've kind of heard the sermon, okay? You don't have to be heroic. Do the small stuff. Do it during the week. It's great to see you on Sundays. Okay? Now, if you want to go a little bit further with me, we can see that Jesus and James are all talking about the heart condition. And one verse that really stuck out to me was, religion is pure and undefiled before God, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You've heard that in the scripture, right? We're supposed to care for the widows and the orphans. It's 
all through the Hebrew scriptures, care for the widows and the orphans. And the reason why Sandra Hack Pulaski says is because in the ancient cult culture, widows and children were the most vulnerable. The way their societal laws were set up, if you were a widow, you were very vulnerable and you were considered, I hate this phrase, the least of these. You were the one who needed help the most if you were a widow or if you were a children. And so it caused me to wonder, well, who are our widows and our children these days? Who are our, our most vulnerable people? Who are the people that we need to be looking out and serving so that we can, in truth, live out God's love and grace? And I thought, well, you know what, let's start with this women and children thing. And so I looked up some statistics for us, and there are a lot of single parents in the United States. In 2009, there were 13.7 million single parents, and 22, they had 22 million children. Think about that. And the majority of them were single moms. Single moms raising kids by themselves. 30%, 30.4% of single moms live in poverty. And 18.8% single dads live in poverty. And 13% of them use food pantries. So I think there's still a need for us to be looking at how do we support single moms, single dads, children of single families. I looked up statistics on that they've done on studies about children in single parent families, and I'm not even going to tell you about them because they hurt too much. But the truth is, it takes a village, and we got to be a village. And we got a lot of people who are just doors away from us who are trying to hold it all together trying to get them to school, get the homework done, get them fed, and they need our help. They're the vulnerable around us. They need our help. And probably people who weren't realized when the charge was to care for widows and orphans were people who suffer from PTSD or other mental health. 40% of the people in jail now have a diagnosed mental health condition. They're not being treated correctly. They need support around them. They need care. They don't need to be shoved in a prison cell. There's a lot of vulnerable people around us. And the call is, what are we doing? What are we doing differently? There's another point in the text a little bit later on in James where it basically says, if you meet someone who's hungry, and you don't give them food, and you tell them, God bless you, really? You see somebody who has a need, and you have the ability to do that. And instead of meeting that need, you say, God bless you, take care. Oh, come worship us on a Sunday with us. Oh, wait a minute, maybe not. What kind of witness is that? So friends, I'm, I invite you to look at your heart a little bit. How are we reaching out? How are we seeing the people around us in need? What are we doing when we see them? What are we doing when we hear them? What are we doing when we encounter them? Because really living out our Christian faith is stepping into those moments. I found myself going, okay, I can just put this broad thing out here and people will go, okay, so now what am I supposed to do? But let me just throw through a, a few ideas out. We created an amazing community garden over just a few blocks away at McKinley. I drove by the other day and it looks like it's got some mounds of a lot of weeds. We have some faithful people who've attended to that community garden but they need more help. That's a place where we can help people in our community who need fruits and, or vegetables because we have fruit trees. And it's starting to lie fallow. So I'm going to call forth green thumbs. That's a way we can do this. And, and we're having challenges getting people to serve on our, our monthly commitment for the bridge. That's a way of helping hunger. When our outreach is coming, 
And we're going to need people who can shuttle people to shelters or people who would greet people at the shelters. People who would even stay all night to keep people safe at the shelters. There's gobs of need around us, and I'm just going to invite you to, to spend some time this week checking your heart. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Is there something that I think I should be doing? And maybe I'm a little afraid to do it, but call a friend. Get a mutual companion to go with you if it's really a fear thing. Or call me. We can do it. Hang out together in the garden or whatever. I want you to check your heart as I check mine to see where are the places I need to step up. Yesterday I was listening to NPR. You all know I listen to that a great deal. And I'd never think that a, the Splendid Table radio show would be one that would preach. But there was a man being interviewed on his new cookbook from Senegal. And it's called From the Source to the Bowl. And it did sound like they had some really good recipes in it. And uh, Lynn Rosado Cain, I think is her name, Lynn said to him, so why did you name it the bowl and not the plate? Why is it the bowl? And she said, and you use this word a lot. I think it was like tangarne or something like that. Sorry, didn't see the transcript, can't practice it. But why do you use bowl instead of the plate? And he said, because that is part of our culture. We have one big bowl. And when dinner is ready, everyone stops. And we all gather around the one bowl. And we all eat from the same bowl. That's our way of being in community with one another. Think of the significance of that. You're eating from the same bowl as everyone and then he goes on to say, and we understand that when we have the other at our bowl, we are blessed. The unknown person, the stranger, the visitor, when they eat from our bowl, we are blessed. We, get, we rate our wealth in Senegal not by what we have or what someone has by their possessions. We rate their wealth by how much they share. Now I know eating from one bowl is like so counterculture to us. I mean, even good friends, if we go out to lunch, we won't eat off of each other's plates or family. We won't eat off of, we might pass a fork and share. But the idea of our food mingling all together in a bowl, that is so challenging. Aren't you feeling uncomfortable? But that's really what the vision of this text is is that we put our resources together in the bowl and we come together with everyone in our family, everyone in our community, and the other. The ones that we don't know. The friends, the family we haven't met yet. And we share together. And we give what we have generously. I'm not there yet on my heart checkup. But I think that's the vision for us. To be at a place where we are so connected as a community of love and grace that the other is welcome. And that we are rated by how we share, not what we have. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, change and transform our hearts that we might have a bowl that is open to all and that we can freely share. Help us see our most vulnerable, no matter how they look. Help us to respond to the need around us, that we might help have healthy and pure hearts before you. We pause now. And we lift up our joys and our thanksgiving and our prayer concerns.